Thank you, Phil. Uh, good afternoon to those in Europe and good morning to Americas and good evening in Asia. Um, Phil mentioned my 300 plus days of travel a year, but the only travel that I've really done in the past seven weeks is between my room and the kitchen and between one monitor screen to the other. I'm excited to chair this uh, panel today with uh, three amazing panelists, uh, Professors Nick Jennings of Imperial, Osi Nakarinen of Alto, and uh, Stefan Oestlund from KTH. So today we'll be discussing what kind of role universities should play in economic growth and driving innovation. This topic is timely, of course, given the recent stress and frequent public discussions about the best policies to open, close, and grow the global economy during and after the COVID-19 pandemic. I, for one, think universities have a crucial role to play in guiding and shaping these important debates. Now, because we have just enjoyed the release of the second year of THE's impact rankings, we will center today's discussion around two SDGs, number eight and nine. The format of this one hour panel will be as follows. We'll be, uh, we will bring uh, a 10 minute presentation on the scholarly research of SDG eight and nine by Bashak Kandemir. Then this will be followed by each of our panelists providing two to three minutes rebuttal to the presentation. Then the same panelists will each spend about five minutes to present their views on the topic of the session. Now, this should allow almost half hour of active panel debate with a few questions from myself, as well as some selected questions from you, the audience. I've asked our panelists to keep their responses not too long so that we can entertain as many of your questions as possible. And I will also be giving our panelists a one minute warning as their time comes up. So please feel free to type your questions into the Zoom chat box and we'll be selecting some, uh, some, some of them to ask the panelists. And with that, let's get started with Bashak's presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bashak Jandir, and I'm the head of financial services for Europe and emerging markets at Alzheimer. Today, I'm going to briefly talk about the global scholarly trends in SDGs 8 and 9 with a slight focus on academic corporate collaboration, hoping that the data starts interesting conversations with our panelists and our guests. I believe there's no need for me to give an introduction on the SDGs, but I would like to recap what the SDG 8 and SDG 9 are. SDG 8 is on decent work and economic growth, and SDG 9 is on industry, innovation, and infrastructure. We believe that these SDGs are particularly relevant for the discussion on how the universities collaborate with the industry to help boost innovation and advance economic growth. Factors such as increased share of expenditure on R&D, financed and performed by business, and the expectation from universities to demonstrate their economic and social relevance makes university industry links a focal topic. Earlier this morning, my colleague Jeroen Bas presented the underlying data for the THE impact rankings, which is also linked to the SDG data dis displayed here. Our first analytical work on SDGs was the Sustainability Science in a Global Landscape Report published in 2015. Building on that briefly, our methodology for assigning publications to different SDGs is based on search strings that we use to query the Scopus database. The keywords and the queries were developed in consultation with internal and external experts to ensure that they are relevant to the indicators for SDGs as defined by the UN. The queries and the processes for defining them are available in a dedicated Mandalay website as linked here. I appreciate that it will not be possible for you to read the queries here, but this is just to give you a glimpse of what the queries look like for SDGs 8 and 9. In order to give more context to the SDGs, I would like to show you the top 20 topic clusters by output for each SDG. The topic clusters are publication sets formed based on the citation links between publications, and there are over 1,500 topic clusters. The size of the topic cluster's name is proportional to the number of publications in each topic cluster for that SDG, and the color of the topic cluster shows a prominence percentile of each topic cluster. Very simply put, Prominence is an indicator of the momentum around the topic. As you can see, there is an apparent overlap between the two SDGs, indicated by the underlying topic clusters, such as monetary policy, economic growth, industry innovation and entrepreneurship, and energy and economics, among others. 
To talk a little bit about scholarly trends, we take the analysis period as 2009 and 2018, where the global scholarly output grew by 3.5% overall. In the same period, number of publications in SDG 8 grew by 8.1% and publications in SDG 9 grew by 5.2%. The small chart on the bottom right shows the growth of all SDGs except SDG 3 and 7 for visibility reasons. SDG 3 is the largest SDG publication set with nearly 700,000 publications in 2018. SDG 7 had the largest growth between 2009 and 2018, with a CAGR compound annual growth rate of 13%. The lowest number of publications was in SDG 1, no poverty, and the slowest growth was for SDG 4, quality education. SDG 8, in that sense, is in the middle of the pack among the other SDGs, and SDG 9 is further down the road in terms of scholarly output. For SDGs 8 and 9, the steeper growth after 2015 is likely to be driven by the increased number of publications from China, which brings us to the next slides on the top countries by output. The bar chart on the left shows the number of publications per country and the percentages at the end of each bar shows the share of that country's publications within that SDG. Finally, the color here shows the average field weighted citation impact, FWCI. FWCI is a normalized citation indicator where one indicates world average, below world average, below one, is indicated in blue, and above world average is indicated in green. Here we can see that the whole, for the whole period, the US was the most published country, followed by China and the UK. And actually, as of 2018, China took over the US, becoming number one country in terms of annual number of publications. The most published countries in general are not surprising, and these countries are also the global leaders in research output overall. However, we also see other countries such as South Africa, Malaysia, and Romania, which are not in top 20 globally. This is better indicated by the radar chart on the right, showing the relative activity index of the top 20 countries in this SDG. The relative activity index divides the share of a country's publications in that SDG with their global share overall, where anything above one shows a larger focus. While South Africa accounted for 0.7% of all global publications in this period, it accounted for 2.5% of the publications in SDG, which is why we see that it is much further out in the radar chart. On the other hand, countries like the US, China, and Germany published relatively less in this SDG. When we look at subject areas and relative key phrase of publications associated with these countries, we see interesting trends. For example, the US has a very large focus on social sciences with key phrase such as economic growth and development in focus, driven by the main players in this country, such as the World Bank, Cal University of California, Stanford, and Columbia. The UK also has a focus on social sciences, economics, and business, and both countries have high shares of international and corporate collaboration. On the other hand, China publishes mainly in engineering and environmental science journals with focus on key phrases such as economics, industry, regional planning, and sustainable development. Research is driven mainly by the Chinese Academy of Sciences and with relatively lower share of international cooperation. While the average FWCI for China for the period was under one, in, in reality, its FWCI increased from below the world average of 0.5 in 2009 to above the world average in 2018 to 1.2. Russia also went from being the last of the pack in 2009 to ninth place in 2018 with a 37% growth rate in publications. And its FWCI has tripled from below the world average to above the world average. Its focus has been on Russia and economic development and research was driven by the Russian Academy of Sciences with limited international collaboration. When we look into countries with the higher relative activity indexes, such as South Africa, Malaysia, and Romania, we see that their focus was on their countries and region, growth and development, with relatively lower shares of international collaboration and a limited share of academic corporate collaboration. In terms of top publishers in SDG 9, we see again similar countries, but we also see countries such as Indonesia, Malaysia, and Taiwan focusing relatively more on SDG 9. The most published country, China, had a fluctuating trend until 2015, after which 
after which its publications increased deeply, becoming number one. And also FWCI increased from below the world average to above the world average. Key phrases such as innovation, industrial engineering, and information management decline with an increase in transportation related key phrases. The US also focused on transportation with, uh, with publications in journals around engineering, social sciences, and computer science. On the other hand, the UK had less of a focus on transportation and more on other topics such as innovation, research, and firms. Indonesia and Malaysia's focus was on their respective countries, traffic, SMEs, and industry. When we look into academic corporate collaboration, and academic corporate collaboration here is defined as those publications by where at least one entity, one author is from an academic entity and one is from a corporate entity. Between 2009 and 2018, the global share of publications, the average global share of publications with academic corporate collaboration remained stable around 2.5%. For most SDGs, the share was below this level, with the exception of SDG 7 on affordable and clean energy and SDG 14, life below water. The lowest shares of academic corporate collaboration were observed for SDG 5, gender equality, and SDG 4, quality, and edu quality of education. For both SDG 8 and 9, the shares have fluctuated, but on average for the period, the share of Academic corporate collaboration for SDG 8 was 1.1%, for, and for SDG 4, 9, it was 2.4%, placing SDG 9 closer to the global average. In terms of individual countries, uh, the countries had mostly fluctuating shares, and the numbers were limited, which makes it difficult to drive meaningful observations. However, for SDG 8, with 6.2% in 2018, Sweden was one of the countries with the highest share of academic corporate collaboration. For SDG 9, countries such as Germany, France, and Japan, Japan and the UK had shares over 6%. When we look into the top corporate entities, we see that some of the most published corporate entities, such as the World Bank, State Grid, VTT, Microsoft, are present in both SDGs. And again, the absolute numbers of publications are quite limited to drive strong conclusions. We observe, from, we observe that the output from the World Bank has fluctuated across the analysis period for both SDGs and maintained a focus on economic growth. For other corporate entities such as IBM, we observe key phrases such as management, clouds, growth in materials, which aligns with their focus. An interesting and differentiated focus is from the VTT, which has circular economy, sustainable, and development as some of the key phrases that emerge. In these final slides, I would like to go back to the topic clusters I showed at the beginning, with a focus on top clusters for publications with academic corporate collaboration and with international collaboration. The underlying clusters in each group shows clusters that are not in the overall top 20 for the relevant SDGs. In SDG 8, we see that in academic corporate collaboration, topics such as cognitive radio or fiber optic networks emerge. And for international collaboration, we see more focus on topics such as deforestation and water resources. An interesting question to pose here to see is to what extent there's an overlap or a difference between the topics covered by different entities, such as corporates or universities, especially in a post-COVID world. While there are some overlaps, we also see less focus on things like water resources or deforestation in publications that are coming out of academic corporate collaboration. For SDG 9, we also see that there is a stronger alignment between international collaboration and overall topics, and again, some more focus for academic corporate collaboration. When looking into the future, I think there are some interesting questions that emerge out of the data. We see that the research goes beyond the big players. Are all relevant countries included in the research collaborations for the SDGs? We see that the share of academic corporate collaboration is mainly below the global average for most of the SDGs. Is this enough to achieve the sustainable development goals or do we need more of academic corporate collaboration? We also see that there seems to be a topic differentiation between the sectors. And this brings the question of whether there is enough there's, whether there's sufficient collaboration on topics that matter most in the post-COVID world. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to turn to Ossie first.
and uh, ask to provide your two to three minute uh, rebuttal first. And then I'm going to go next to Nick, followed by Stefan. Please. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, yeah, YS. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank for the opportunity for being here. I'm, I'm glad to be part of the panel and good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone where, wherever you are. A couple of points. Um, of course, well, I'm really excited about statistics every time when I see, see ones. And here we have very important and, and interesting information about publications that have to do with SDGs 8 and 9. And to some extent, probably they tell something about other SDGs as well. But um, looking from a university perspective and thinking about our uh, cooperation and collaboration with industry or, or companies, uh, of course, uh, looking that through publications only tells about a certain aspect of, of what we do and probably other universities do. And I do hope that we can cover the other aspects as well in, in the panel later today. Um, also, uh, even though these types of, of analysis are important and interesting, as I said, they necessarily look backwards. And now when we try to understand what we should do in the future in the post-COVID world, we, we really need to start looking forward. And of course, understanding history helps there, but we cannot stick to that. Maybe the third point I'd like to raise at this point is that uh, coming from a small country on top of the planet, where we speak strange languages. Um, of course, these analyses cover mostly publications written in English. And there are lots of interesting things happening in other countries published in, in German, Spanish, French, Chinese, and so on. And um, just to keep this in mind when we go on, this gives a very nice and good picture of a certain part of the discussion and activities, but we need to have other aspects in mind. Thanks, I, I think that was roughly three minutes. Thank you. On to you, Nick. Thank you. Um, uh, I, I want to start with a similar point to Ossi, in fact, about the, the means of publication capturing, capturing engagement. So some of our uh, industrial collaborations, of which we have many at, at Imperial, do result in publications, genuine joint publications between the academics uh, doing the work and sort of some of the industrial folk who are helping to solve, shape the problem, define the problem and solve it. And so some of them do result in publications, but I would say it's a, it's a very small fraction and I would guess that less than Less than 10% of the industrial engagements that we have at Imperial result in academic publications. They, they do great work, uh, but the focus is often quite targeted into, into more impact either within the company or, with it, or without. And so I think the publication lens is very interesting and lets you get some trends, but it's very much uh, far from being the, the whole picture. And I also think sort of the the focus on academic and corporate engagement. This is the other key part, which is uh, um, government in engagement, government and, and third party and NG NGOs uh, all working together. And I, if I think about sort of Imperial's work at the moment in, in COVID, it's, uh, it's facilitated by all of those parties working together, but you won't see publications where you have all of those actors on as publications. It, so you, there's a lot of infrastructure and there's a lot of impact that's just not captured by, um, by publications. I think sort of as we do move to a, to a post-COVID world, whatever, whatever that looks like, whatever our new normal becomes, I hope that we keep some of the, some of the focus and collab collaborations and benefits that we've, we've had from, from good collaborations with with our industry partners. So we, we have some great collaborations that have gone on for a long time, but we've also had a few that have really just uh, spun up and they, uh, in response to COVID. And I hope we keep those and I hope we keep the momentum from all of those. Thank you. 
Those are very valuable points. Thank you. Stefan? Yes, um, well, <laughs> from my side, I'm also happy to be part of this panel, uh, even though I would have preferred that you all would have been in Stockholm at this time of the year, as planned. Have a beautiful day here with the perfect 18 degrees, uh, not too hot, not too cold. So we we'll have to come back later to, to this. Well, uh, listen to the presentation. I fully agree with Nick and Ossie in many ways. Um, it's, uh, of course, difficult to measure impact in that way. I will come back to that later as well when we, we discuss the, the topic more in detail. Um, what is in, I have some few reflections directly on the presentation, and one of them is, of course, uh, in the SDG 8 and 9 are somewhat difficult in, in the way that, well, there are many of them are difficult, but, but uh, what we try to do with SDGs, of course, has goals, and, and uh, what is difficult to differ is sometimes uh, to, to do research and measure the goals or actually work behind the goals. And very often the work behind the goals is, is uh, of more importance for, for, for the universe itself than, than actually achieving the goal because the goal itself is achieved by society at the very end of it. And, and that is, of course, uh, one reflection from my side. Uh, another reflection which I, I liked a little bit myself is when we look at SB8, for instance, as, as um, uh, very often academic corporate clusters uh, focus on products, whereas uh, uh, international research focus on resources, and uh, that perhaps could be something we could discuss further later on. It's interesting to see that we don't, we don't do academic corporate uh, research as much on resources as we do on products. Uh, with my reflection, someone else might have some, uh, made the same reflection. Thanks. Thank you. Those are all very uh, important um, feedback from the presentation. Clearly, we're going to try to spend some time today, uh, later on, trying to figure out how else do we measure uh, the impact of what universities do in these regards, right? So now I'm going to turn back to Ossie and ask him, uh, how is Alto currently addressing the challenges posed by SDG 8 and 9? Can you, you know, you have four or five minutes to please uh, share with us how Alto is doing. Okay, thanks. Of, of course, we try to do very many things at the, at the same time, but uh, maybe I start with uh, telling that we just updated our strategy. And uh, in our case, uh, we don't uh, think that strategy is a piece of paper that we write every five years or so and then put it somewhere down under the table, but uh, actually we do think the strategy does take place in concrete actions and, and practices what we do. And we had a very long and thorough community process where we engaged all of our members, including students. And um, I think there are some aspects in, in the strategy which are perfect in my mind to face the challenges now under the, the pandemic and after that. Namely, um, there are three uh, what we call uh, cross-cutting themes and one of the uh, first of those uh, is uh, what we call solutions for sustainability. So as a university where we have technical fields, we have business school, we have art and design, we are really focusing on offering solutions for these big challenges and problems, or at least partial solutions. Not only analyzing what uh, the problems are and how should we understand how things function, but really try to find solutions. Another uh, a cross-cutting theme is uh, radical creativity, which means that, of course, all universities are full of creative people, but in many cases, uh, we are focusing more or less incremental creativity. We, we take small steps towards some goals, but we also want to uh, emphasize and test whether we can uh, do something else, be more radical, because if we look backwards and see the troubles where we are in, we need to do things differently in the future. And so it might need some radical thinking. And the third aspect 
uh, which we find uh, important is entrepreneurial mindset, which doesn't mean that each and every student who graduates from Alto or all of our uh, faculty members should have their own company or something like this, but they should be thinking like entrepreneurs, take responsibility, uh, do some practical actions to, to achieve their goals. And um, these uh, three uh, put together um, with our three main values, namely responsibility, courage and collaboration uh, should function fairly well for, for facing these issues. Of course, this might sound like a very upper level uh, uh, ideological uh, way of thinking, but uh, we really want to make these things happen. And that how we are at the moment trying to do that is that we, we uh, resolve, uh, refer resources for experiments in all these aspects and uh, we are monitoring that things really take place uh, and uh, this monitoring is happening through our uh, normal uh, annual clock processes so it's not as i said uh, strategy is not just a piece of paper but uh, we really need to check that we go into these directions that I just mentioned. And uh, a big part of that is collaboration with companies. And uh, that means uh, joint research projects, uh, joint uh, teaching practices, uh, technology transfer, shared infrastructures, and so on. And I hope I can give some examples later on when we move on to the panel discussion. But that's what, what's going on right now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Nick, as you take over your time, could you elaborate a little more on, you know, what you mentioned earlier about the innovation ecosystem at Imperial as well? Thank you. Sure. Happy to. Thank, thank you. So Imperial is a university that's always been committed to doing research and education for the benefit of society and that for the benefit of society was in our founding charter and I think is a strong trait and characteristic that many at the university hold. And for the benefit of society means that we have particularly strong uh, industrial engagements. It means that we care about doing excellent research and education, but actually a research and education that leaves the lab and that leads the classroom and actually makes a difference out in the world. And it also means that we've had strong government partnerships because actually that's an important way of us um, making our impact. So just some figures. So at Imperial, we have over 500 corporate partners. That means we have 500 companies and organizations that we have a research uh, relationship with. We, our annual uh, industry funded uh, research is about 70 million pounds a year and we have about 130 active startups at the moment. So it's a very active, vibrant culture where, where industry engagement and entrepreneurship are not something new that we're sort of introducing. It, it's something that has always been there, but I think has been somewhat amplified uh, more recently. So we, we care a lot about the academic excellence and its impact. And like all universities in the UK, UK we are subject to uh, an evaluation framework that actually puts a value on, on the impact that you generate. Uh, so the, our research excellent framework gives us money. Uh, and so it actually matters. It's a ranking table that actually is direct gives you pounds and part of that is on outputs but and also a good chunk of it is also on impact so the narrative where you've been able to say we did this piece of research various things happened and this is the real world impact so for us it's a tangible monetary uh, endeavor that's part of the university as i said it's been strong in uh, in our staff for a long time so we have over over 40 of our spin outs are associated with the various SDGs in fact so sort of some of those are in in energy and health and poverty um, but sort of that's a that's a key guiding characteristics and we have some really enduring um, industrial partnerships so if I take 
our partnership with Shell, for example, which has been going on for about 25 years now. It's involved over 300 people at the college. It's a, spread across 10 different departments and is a, has a funding portfolio of about 30 million pounds. And that's, that's a real sort of strategic, enduring industry partnership for us. And it's got lots of, lots of touch points, lots of ways of in, engaging across a whole broad range of topics. And of course, over the 25 years, that has changed a lot. Most of the focus now is on, is on sustainable, uh, new means of production and those sorts of things, rather than sort of where it was 25 years ago. But I think the big change that I've seen uh, um, in the UK, and I see a lot of at Imperial, is engagement with students in entrepreneurship. Um, so a while ago, it used to, be a, it used to be a minority sport, I would say. Some did it, um, and they were the enthusiasts. But now, actually, so many of our students want to do that. So through our enterprise lab, um, we engage about 2,000 of our students every year. So 2,000 of our undergraduates are involved in some form or another with our enterprise lab. And some of that is about uh, learning what it's like to, to start up a company, how you protect intellectual property, how you learn to pitch, how you get money and those things. We have a variety of, of competitions that we run where they win monetary prizes, where they get mentorship and sort of a, 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 a program that they go through, an eight week uh, innovation program that they go through that takes them through that. And so that's been really impressive. As I said, 2000 students. Last year, the the students at Imperial started over 50 new businesses um, that raised 28 million pounds and created over 300 jobs. So it, it really is sort of something very vibrant that many of our students just want to do. I'm particularly proud of our women entrepreneur program. So we have a specific dedicated program for females uh, that we've run for a number of years now. And that has that's seen 250 women go through and created 34 companies. And so it started because our enterprise lab, um, we noticed a lack of female representation. And so we wanted to take an active measure to, to, um, to rectify that and, and to do something different about it. And actually what we see is that that's sort of really upping the number of female entrepreneurs that we're getting into our more general programs as well as the, as well as, well as the female only specific problem. I would say that uh, going forward, um, a lot of the activities have been based on physical presence and, um, and what we're looking to do is seeing, partly driven by COVID, but also partly by expansion of how we can, how we can reach more of our students. And so that's a sort of blended online and digital uh, way of doing so. Thank you. Thank you, it's very rich. Um, so, uh, Stefan, maybe you can give a little more context about your, who your stakeholders are and yeah. how KTH works with government and industry to solve these so-called societal challenges, please. Well, thank you, Boyas. Uh, I think uh, being the last one in the line, uh, there are some things already mentioned, but uh, I think uh, from our KTH side, one important aspect to make impact is uh, what I think Nick touched upon that earlier, that to, well, we are, we are used to work, we are a technical university, used to work with companies, with industry, uh, and in some cases you also work with authorities and you work with public agencies and, and also on the political side. I think it's very important that you consider them all to be like industry partners. For us at Kate Edge, one very important, especially now in, in, the, in, the, in the COVID-19, aspect that we have good relations to not only industry but to the regions of Stockholm in, in our case to, to the city of Stockholm because they have responsibilities for various aspects of, of this kind of medical care, uh, transportation, uh, care of elderly people. So that is important to, to understand that the stakeholders are not only industry or corporate uh, entities it's also important to realize that we have the more uh, public, the political side as, as a stakeholder for, for our university. And the very strong part comes when these start to work together. When you have a typical industry, you have a, a region, which is a public agency you have, or a public authority, 
and you have perhaps the city and the university. When you get all these working together in demonstrations, sometimes research, you gain uh, acceptance for the research, for, for the activities of each of us, which is, is above what you can do with, with one of, of us, uh, in a bilateral, by, by, by two, two partnership uh, relation. So that is, uh, I think, for all of us uh, at universities in the future, uh, really to, to broaden the perspective of, of our stakeholders, and especially, especially it might be our task to tie them together. In fact, that was my, my hold on slide, to uh, hold on to slide, but uh, I, I can do without that one if, if necessary. Uh, the second part uh, well, that I would like to raise is, is innovation, of course. Uh, innovation is very popular. Everyone is talking about innovation today. And, and um, very often, innovation is measured as uh, how much money you have raised, how many companies that have been started or, or startup that have been, have been been, been introduced to, or the company can measure or the, the universe can measure how many patents or the IPR uh, turnover you get from, 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 from these uh, companies. That is of course important. It's, it's, it's a very nice measure. It's a very nice way of, of telling very good stories. But I think it's very important that we find solutions for early innovation, early entrepreneurship. Nick is touching upon, upon that as well. But there are so many different readiness levels in innovation, and we sometimes fail to, 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 to tie them together. Um, this morning, I was actually sitting in a, in a board meeting with one of the EIT Kicks, where I'm part of the board, and, and we are doing very well at that end, at very high readiness levels. We're doing very well, uh, introduction of new companies. Uh, and on university level, sometimes we have uh, lots of good ideas from students, from young faculty. Still, even if uh, the public side tries to, to come up with new ideas, new programs, new schemes to, to, to do that, there's always a link in between which is missing, which I think we have to work on at universities as well as uh, with our stakeholders in the future. Um, Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, start the Q&A now. Uh, give, given all these great backgrounds you provided, I'm going to go first to Nick. Uh, Imperial College launched a response fund to supplement government and existing uh, philanthropy to provide support for vital projects in uh, addressing COVID-19, such as developing vaccines, improving diagnostics, advancing therapies, and providing essential health care. Why do you think this kind of fund was needed? And is this an indication of a role that universities in general should be doing more to fill on a regular basis in the future? Nick, you're mute. So the hour and a half before this meeting, I've spent allocating some of that fund, in fact. So um, for, for us, it, in the UK, I, I think we're, get, we're getting more used to philanthropy and sort of our, our current president came from the US and we specifically wanted to make advancement and philanthropy a, a much bigger part of the imperial and I think in the UK than it had been before. Uh, we found in our, in our offer uh, when we set up this fund to, that people really want to help actually and we want to give them a way of, of helping and sort of we've had many sort of smaller donations uh, and so sort of really built that up, you know, people donating less than a hundred pounds uh, uh, to it. And we've also had some multi-million pound uh, donations to specific things. So some of our, some of our vaccine work um, that's been very prominent in the news in the UK is, um, is it received significant uh, philanthropic uh, investment and and also uh, government investment and that speaks to the point that Stefan made actually about making sure that you have good connections to government. I've focused quite a lot on industry partnerships but our relationships with government are, are equally important. Right, great answer. Ossi, I have a question for you. When people think of economic growth, they often think about computer science, engineering or business as key driving principles. What do you think is the role of aesthetics and the arts at a university level in supporting economic growth? 
Well, first of all, I'd like to <laughs> challenge the, the uh, goal of the eternal growth. I mean, should we grow all the time and get bigger and bigger from the economic point of view? Maybe we can leave that aside here, but uh, just to, to maybe point out that that's not quite unproblematic approach either. But um, if we are aiming at uh, growth in a good sense, um, I do think there's plenty of, of, of uh, not only ideas, but uh, concrete examples where art, design, architecture, creative technologies have a crucial role in, in uh, national economy or economy of a city and so on. Uh, for example, everybody understands how important um, all types of art forms and design aspects are for the city of London, for example, or, or New York City. Uh, why do tourists come there? They want to see certain things that are created by uh, creative industries, if, if you will. But uh, that's only one part of the story, um, because I, I do think that uh, nowadays it's not that um, easy to really see, for example, engineering and design as separate things, or sciences from the arts. They, there are groups, uh, researchers groups, uh, where we have, at least in our university and I know elsewhere, there are multidisciplinary groups uh, which need different types of perspectives. Diversity is shown to be good for uh, developing things further. So I don't think that uh, there's any reason to, to think otherwise. Uh, there's enough, uh, enough examples where it functions very well when we put different types of people together. And it's not only in, in uh, cooperation with companies, but also with governments. For example, we, we do have a program called Design for Government, where we help uh, ministries to develop their processes uh, through AI, through uh, design, through partly also through artistic means, when we are able to make other types of things visible than we could if we just use traditional ways of approach. A pretty Thank long for answer that. perhaps, but- No, that's uh, okay. No, but I, something out of it. Well, I think it's very important to hear this because we constantly think of STEM always, you know, when we think about economic yes. growth or innovation. There's so much innovation in the humanities side as well. Uh, I'm going to now go to Stefan for my last question before we go to the audience questions. Uh, and uh, it's about KTH, of course. Um, so KTH is really known for collaborating closely with industry. I mean, Spotify was one of them, right? Uh, and also hosts two out of the three European knowledge and innovation communities formed by EU, uh, their European Institute of Innovation and Technology. In fact, I found out that KTH is enjoying an academic corporate collaboration of 10.1%. Just to put that in perspective, the whole of Sweden is 8% and the whole of the world average is 2.6. So it's roughly four times the global average. How has KTH built these strong relationships with the industry. And are there lessons that you would like to share with the audience? Yeah, I'm not sure it's, it's only a KTH aspect of it, but, but uh, as with, say with Finland, Sweden is not a very big country, uh, but we have a huge amount of relatively big companies uh, compared to the size of the country. You, half of ABB is Swedish, Ericsson, Scania, Volvo, uh, Electrolux. So you, you have a lot of companies as well as new ones coming up. So, so being one of the key players in the STEM field, so to say, in such a small country, you have a strong link to, to, to industry uh, by nature. And, and, and uh, keeping that traditional working together with companies with academia as well as with uh, uh, the public side 
is 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 of course very important. It's it, it um, in some way I think it's a consequence of what I mentioned before the fact that you have to to make an impact you have to uh, keep all these partners or stakeholders in the same boat so to say. Uh, it helps in 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 of course. Then, then the strategy from our side is to have a strong link to industry and to our stakeholders. We are really working with a relatively limited number of our very, what we call strategic partners, which, which the idea with them is actually not only to do research, but also to do this kind of impact work and to do, have a common strategy and to understand each other. Roughly to understand the, the stakeholders is also very important. So every year our, our President and, and, and vice presidents meet with the, the CEO of, of, of uh, these companies, not only with a research director or with some researcher, but they meet with people on a very high level to have a strategy that can be in common, which of course makes this kind of work long term, I would say. All about relationship, long term relationship. Sure. <laughs> okay, I have a question from a concerned Jack Grove here. I've heard that industry-funded research has been decimated by the coronavirus crisis. Is this true? Could a government bailout help as a stopgap while this funding stream recovers? Can any one of you address these, please? Yes, Nick. So I would say that uh, we, we have been far from decimated uh, in our engagement. So. Um, we might yet come to be decimated, but my experience is at the moment is some of our industrial partners are, are feeling uh, the, the strain and the pressure on their business and, and their existence. And so we're working closely with them and with governments to, to see what can be done. And that might not be the bailout, that might be things like greater flexibility in terms of sort of when payment is, is due for particular, uh, for particular um, grants and so on. But generally, I, we've, we've not seen that, uh, we've not seen that in, at Imperial. Um. Yes, I'll see. It's, it's probably too early to say what's going to happen in, in a year's time or so. Immediately, we are not seeing any, anything of that type. And of course, this situation is very different, different types of countries where, for example, um, in our case, uh, more than 60% of our income is from the government. And uh, of course, we do lots of uh, industry collaboration. And in those cases where we do, uh, there seems to be very good understanding that um, in the long run, even if we now are in a crisis, uh, Industries need to invest in in research and education as well, and and it seems quite promising at the moment. But of, of course, there will be challenges uh, when we are in probably at the end of the year or next year. But uh, not immediate crisis. I, I, I'm not seeing Thank that. Thank you, Stefan. Well, yes, uh, I agree with us in this way. Uh, I was talking about long-term relations, and, and we have seen crises before, uh, and, and more uh, direct economic crises for company like if telecom is going bad for, 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 for some time, or if automotive industry is have, struggling. So, so with a long-term relation, uh, we can have a drop one or two years, but, but keeping the relation keeps the level at least uh, to a decent level. Of course, uh, it's too early to say right now. We have only placed this for three months. So, 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 so coming back in a year or two, we can, we can probably have a better answer. I think that's a very wise uh, set of answers we just got. I have a question, on a slightly different question from uh, Mahinder Reddy in Hyderabad, India. How can we get over the COVID crisis, save lives, and also generate employment and income, especially in the informal and small scale sector? What can university do to help? Mm. Go ahead, Nick. 
So uh, Imperial has really played, certainly in the UK, a massive part in, um, in the government's response. And indeed, apparently we even got Donald Trump to listen to some science and to change his science policy with our report, which I, I think is a major achievement. Uh, so we've done lots in terms of shaping our government's response in terms of epidemiology, in terms of uh, vaccine development, and then also sort of more, more simpler things. So sort of providing uh, we run quite, we have quite a big hack space with lots of 3D printers and we've used that for, for personal protect, protective equipment. And so sort of, you know, across those length scales, actually, um, we, we've really engaged a lot. And I think sort of, for me, the, the thing I've really noticed in the UK is, you know, we have a daily briefing either by the prime minister or a senior minister. They are almost invariably flanked by two scientists. And that's fantastic because I think sort of science has gone through sort of certainly in the UK a bit of a dip in the in the lack of experts and sort of you know opinions opinions counting as much as expertise and actual facts. And I think this um, this uh, this pandemic has really shown the value of expertise and the value that scientists can make to society. And anyone else? Because I I happen to think that it's scientists, but it's also non-scientists, just experts in general, right? Whether they're experts in, in uh, psychology or uh, even though that is also part of social science, but also in the arts and, and in human relationships and so on. So uh, I think also you had your, your uh, finger up. Yeah, I think, I think somebody mentioned earlier that the whole ecosystem around university is important in, in many ways. But here also, we, we cannot think uh, within the university that we could know what the uh, small companies need or how we could uh, help others if we are not constantly communicating and doing things together with uh, uh, all kinds of organizations and people around us. That's why, for example, we have uh, more than 100 startups working on campus so that we can be in touch all the time and they, they can tell us what we could do for them. And uh, slightly after the, the outbreak of, of the latest phase of, of the crisis started in Finland, uh, we opened a channel for anyone that they can ask for help. The, the channel is called Aalto Helps, Aalto University Helps, and we, we are constantly receiving ideas and questions that, hey, could university do this and could, could you do that? And uh, in some cases we can, in some cases we uh, advise that maybe you should contact some other, some other uh, uh, university perhaps or some other organization, but really being active, communicating uh, a network with the surrounding world is, is the key. I have one more question before we're going to run out of time, but we may be allowed a little uh, over time. Um, how common in your experience is the sharing of infrastructure? Given commercial interests, can this happen? How can industry be coaxed to invest more in the public sector? This comes from Geraldine Kenny. Who wants to take that question? I'll see first and maybe Stephanie. I, I can give a very, very <laughs> brief, brief answer. It's very typical, very common for us. We try to share our interest as much as possible uh, because it's, there's no point in having a, a expensive uh, infra on campus if nobody uses it and, and we, University itself doesn't need it 24/7, so we we share it. Uh, if I may comment as well, uh, well yes, um, uh, we try to do the same, of course. But, but uh, and you always try to share infrastructure, and build and and and, and um, share the use of it in some way, and you build models. But sometimes the feeling is that the models are very short-lived, uh, short memories, so to say. You have to start reminding the system to, to, to really share the, the resources and remind them about what kind of resources you have. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a, of a difficult question, I would say, actually. Mm. And a small country, again, we, we have to share resources because you cannot have, have, have full resources everywhere at, at, at each university. 
which, which uh, still creates, uh, still not a simple task. I've always felt that university was one of the unique places in our society that still remains to be what I call permanent institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, while other things can come and go, universities must absolutely hold ground as the steadiness for the society as sometimes religion can be and, and, and government should be. But anyhow, um, I have a question that I'm going to direct to Nick, and then I'm going to ask the other two if they want to uh, 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 add anything to it. So one thing that stands out from my looking back at your background, I did a little research on you, uh, is you, not only just your incredible history of uh, impactful research and your dedication to the real world application. Uh, just one example, I know you worked on Rescue Global to deploy system of ML uh, for nonprofit uh, and coordinate you know, the response to 2015 Nepal earthquake. As a VP of research, how do you find the right balance and encourage other researchers to spend more or less time on basic research, applied research, or applications. Do you have a target in mind? And uh, I would like to hear the other two also chime into this question, please, before uh, THE kicks us off the uh, air. <laughs> we certainly don't have any targets. So um, I think when you look at, in, from my position, sort of at a, at a macro level, uh, what you want is is diversity. I think we spoke about diversity of thought earlier on, and actually, what we want is diversity of uh, approaches and and levels of research that we look at. So there are people at Imperial uh, who are you know all their main focus is on fundamental discovery led science, and that is great. And they do particular things, and they don't get particularly involved in. Uh, in industrial collaborations or in translation research, and that's entirely fine. You, great universities should absolutely have people like that. I think sort of we have a good mix of people who also care quite a lot about making that difference, and and sort of I, I we try to put some loose levers to encourage things. So one of the things I set up at Imperial was a Frontier Research Award, uh, where we do three of these a year. They're a quarter of a million pounds each. And these are for fundamental research, uh, frontier research that is, wouldn't be suitable even to go to a research council. It's sort of very much at that forefront. And, and that's really to encourage those fundamental scientists as well as the more applied end of things. Well, uh, just a comment. Uh, I think uh, the characteristics of us being at this kind of panel is that we have a lot of different interests. We like to see implementation, we like to see fundamental research, we like to, do, like to see uh, education, teaching, as well as, um, as, as applied research. So that's probably the characteristics of our kind of people in being in this position. We wouldn't have been in this panel otherwise, I'm, I'm sure about that. I'll see, I, last word before I wrap this thing up and hand it over to Phil. Maybe I'll just uh, say that I cannot agree more of course we need different types and and we are lucky to have both types of researchers yes i think uh universities have really evolved tremendously in the last 25 years that i've been involved with with the university administration or, or of that sort and and i am really proud of the uh, evolution I can't thank you enough, Nick, Ossi, and Stefan, for participating in these uh, difficult times and uh, sharing your wisdom. Uh, you're amazing researchers and you're amazing administrators of research in your institutions. Look forward to visiting you each at your own uh, institutions. And uh, I also want to thank THE for organizing this and for the various members of our staffs of uh, Elsevier and THE for the preparation. Um, there are some questions we didn't get to an answer, and I think, Phil, you're going to give us an opportunity to get back to them. Um, uh, we didn't have time for all of them. Thank you so much, everybody, and be safe and be healthy. <laughs>